Turn with me then, friends, to this well-known account of the <clears throat> finding of a bride for Isaac. And this morning, our theme is God is Sovereign. God is Sovereign. It says in verse 21, And a man wondered at, wondering at her held his peace, to wit, whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. Here he is, poised at, a, at the crucial point in his mission, wandering if the Lord has made his journey prosperous. He's a man who recognized the sovereignty of God. And you and I, friends, have to re recognize the sovereignty of God, that it's with him to determine your prosperity, the prosperity of your way, whether your way will be that right way, the path of righteousness, or some other way, as he says in another place, whether to the right or to the left. Are you sensing that the Lord is making your journey prosperous because it lies with him? Are you seeking him and waiting to see whether the Lord... I remember making a journey in a train... And um, if the men among us had a train set when they were young, they'll know what the points are. The points are the point, are the place where the direction of the train can be changed. And as the train comes along, it has to follow whatever way the points are. If the points are changed over, then the train goes that way. But if they're left there, the train will go that way. The points can be changed. I remember getting a, a ticket for a train to Edinburgh. I got on the train, which was going by car stairs, but unknown to me. I should say, the train was going to, I, was, I had a ticket for Lockerbie. I had a ticket for Lockerbie, but when we got to car stairs, the points directed the train to Edinburgh. It was an Edinburgh train. And I was sitting in the train being carried along. I had no means of changing the direction or the points there. It needed another hand to change these points. And I was carried away, whether I wanted or not, to Waverley, to Haymarket in, in Edinburgh. Uh, these points, friends, are in the hands of the Lord. He will destine what direction your journey will take. Let's see how this follows out in the story. There's so much we could take, as you know, from this story, but we'll concentrate, I hope, on this, especially in the life of Rebecca. First of all, we'll ask who is selected? What is expected? When is it consummated? Who is selected? Three things we can say about this. Who is special? Who is God selecting in his sovereign purpose? Is there something special about us that God should choose us? Yes, there is. It's not in ourselves. I remember asking a man, uh, an intelligent Christian, I would say, out in South Africa, how is it you think that you came to a knowledge of Christ? Because I knew you'd come from an ungodly background. Was there something in you that made the Lord choose you? And he said, well, there must have been. And I said, no, there was nothing in you. There's nothing in you, yourself. But let's but look at it in this case. There was something special about Rebecca. She confessed this 
in verse 15. It came to pass, after he'd done speaking, that, behold, Rebekah came out, born of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. In the purpose of God in those days, he had chosen out a certain line to favor. It began with the line of Seth, as opposed to the line of Cain. We read that when Seth was born, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And then after the flood, the Lord took a special care and prepared a special destiny for each of the sons of Noah, which Noah was able to prophesy to. It says in 1129, <clears throat> it says in 1129, and Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, the father of Iska. You see, this line was preserved. We couldn't do this today. It's not um, it'd be called an incestuous marriage, but in those days, these people had a sense that they must preserve pure the line to which they were called because, as I said, it, Noah had predicted that the line of Shem would uh, have something special. It says here that he cursed Canaan, he blessed, and he said to Shem, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. In other words, he was saying that he was going to tie, link his name and his identity with the Shem and with the children of Shem. He blessed the Lord God of Shem. In fact, it said, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. That's what you and I are doing today. We're here in the tents of Shem. We're here in the tabernacle of the people, the sons of Jacob, of Israel. And uh, so you see, this is the, so the way God's sovereignty worked at that time. And Rebecca was a direct descendant. When she was asked who she was, she didn't say Rebecca. She said, I am the daughter of Nahar and Milcah. Milcah, the mother, is specially singled out because she was not only a, a, a choice of Nahar, a, but she was a daughter of the same family. In other words, God was at work making a special choice and making something special. And you say, well, I'm not special. I can't claim any descendants like that. But friends, we are special in God's divine electing purpose. Not expressed in this way, but in a special way in which God has chosen us in Christ from before the foundation of the world. If you're not chosen in Christ, then you're not special. But if you're chosen in him, because of that relationship, by covenant with Christ, then in fact you become a son and a daughter of Abraham by faith. Who is special? Friends, to be a child of God is to be specially ordained of God. Who is selected? Is it, it is special? And is it, but is it accidental? It seemed as if this was an accident, didn't it? Um, 
Eliezer, the servant of Abraham, was saying, just let it happen. I'm just waiting for this. And it seemed that accidentally, Rebecca just appeared at that moment and people would say, oh, what a coincidence. But of course, with God, there is no coincidence. What seemed accidental? What made Rebecca leave her home at that particular moment? What made her hurry down to the well when there were so many other, it says, so many other women coming with their pictures? But for some reason, Re Rebecca was the one that arrived there at that instant. It says, he had hardly left speaking when there she was in front of him. What an accident, you see. No, of course it wasn't. It's God that moved Rebecca to tie, tie, uh, that timely moment to arrive just when the servant had finished his prayer. It wasn't accidental. It was intentional. And so it is with you and me, friends. You may have arrived at this service this morning saying, I wonder what the minister is going to say. Is it an accident that I chose this passage? Is it an accident that your heart has been prepared to discover that God is dealing with you in a very special and significant way so that you are, have a heightened awareness that God is at work? I'm here under the sovereign grace of Almighty God. It was a sovereign design. Others were excluded. But she was there. Others are doing whatever they are, but you are here at the appointment of God. She was selected too. There's something else about her. She was beautiful. It specially mentions. Why does it mention outward beauty? Well, it does. The damsel was very fair to look upon. Is that why she was chosen? Does God have a special care for people with a beautiful exterior? Handsome appearance. We know that's not true. Why mention the beauty? Because we, we believe, friends, that that beauty of Rebecca was a rare beauty that came from a person who had discovered the way of grace. We see that in the way that she reacted. There was some, some quality within that person that made her radiate that beauty. As Paul says, not <clears throat> the adorning of the outward, but the beauty of a humble and a quiet spirit. Don't we get that sensation, that impression from Rebecca? There's something, there's a beauty about her behavior, about the way that she acts. There's a grace about what she does. When she says, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor, here is a, a girl who thinks beyond herself. She's thinking, who am I? I am the daughter of that special person, that woman. I am the daughter of Bethuel, the do who, is the, who is the son, the bear unto Nahor. She's as if she's someone that seems to have studied her past and rejoiced in who she was 
in the purpose of God. They didn't have Bibles in those days, friends. So how did they grow spiritually? How did they grow in the knowledge of God? It's from the truths that were imparted and handed down. And she felt, I am an heir. I have inherited this godly her inheritance, this godly descent. And that's who she is. She feels she's aware of who she is. And that's what happens, friends, isn't it? When we come into the knowledge of the Lord Jesus, we realize what heirs we are. Yes, we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. We're heirs with the apostles and prophets. We're heirs with the reformers and the covenanters. We're heirs of the disruption, and we are those who are thoughtful, deeply aware of who they are, realize this is my inheritance. It was God's sovereignty at work that brought me to who I am and where I am. Uh, where I am now. <clears throat> Of course, she also, like any a good young person, an old person, reflected the image of God. No doubt she was aware again where she came from. As Adam was made in the image of God, so we bear that image and must be conscious of it. You and I represent God. We don't have any graven images in the church, but with many images in the free church, you are the images of God. And that's all the image we need. But do we, do we have that capacity to draw others to the Lord because we reflect the glory? There's something about Rebecca that reflected the glory of God. That was the true beauty that she had. And then secondly, this is who was selected, yes. We get some idea how Rebecca was prepared for this moment, this moment of truth, just like we are. What then was expected of her? The servant laid down certain conditions. And he wasn't going to pay attention to anyone unless they fulfilled these particular conditions. We could call them marks of grace. What did Rebecca evidence? And it came to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray that, that I may drink. And she shall say, drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. What is it about this grace? What are the marks of grace? Well, first of all, there's the spontaneity of Rebecca. There's no hesitation, is there? Immediately, she receives the request from this stranger. Her heart goes out to this thirsty man and these thirsty camels. It's a mark of grace. It's her care for those in need. She doesn't think of, oh, I'll, need more, I'll have to put more effort in. Uh, this water was intended for my mother and for the, for the household. And for the, no, immediately... She applies this precious water that she has gathered to the needs of a stranger. Remember the Good Samaritan and how he helped the stranger, not like the Pharisee, not like the Levite and the priest. Go and do thou likewise. Yes, Rebecca exhibited this spontaneous spontaneity. She exhibited generosity. You see what Eliezer wanted? He wanted her to go beyond what could be expected. Perhaps it was the custom then to offer a drink to strangers, but not 
Dr. Camel, surely, surely they, there were plenty of men around to do that. They could have done that, but no, you see how Rebecca goes beyond what is expected and required of her. It shows her a generous, a big heart. She just can't help uh, doing as much as she can for others. And it says that she ran to get the water. She just didn't take her time, no. She put herself out. And there's a, a, there's a readiness and a alertness and alacrity in what she does. See what the, the prayer that um, Eliezer had, he said, I pray thee, send me good speed this day. Well, there was speed in Rebecca, wasn't she? She was very fleet, running to the well and going down these steps. The well was probably a, a bit down underground, and she had to go down there, gather in the water, and rush up again more and more. To all these camels, and you know, camels can take in a lot of water. They can take in enough water to last them for two or three days in the desert. So it's no simple task providing the amount of water that all these camels required. And she gave them as much as they had until they had done drinking. Why is that important? Because it was an evidence of grace. The Lord spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also give us all things? And if we've experienced the lavish generosity of God's grace, then it has to show itself in the way that we reach out to others in their need. Marks of grace. There's also modesty. In the fact that she doesn't draw any attention to herself, but only to her family and to where she came from, modesty, the marks of grace. And then there's the awareness. This is what was expected, friends, an awareness of the significance. I think we've looked at this already. This is a young woman who um, was like any normal person. She was obviously pleased to receive these um, ornaments and uh, bangles, uh, bracelets and things, uh, but they didn't seem to be the chief thing in her mind. There was an awareness that became aware, that soon became aware something is happening here. This is the day in which my hopes are being realized. The fact that she was a beautiful young woman meant, I'm sure, that there were many young men uh, hovering around or even making advances and seeking her attention and attraction. But despite her beauty, she had resisted all of these. She felt there was something special intended for her. And as this... Uh, as um, the servant recounted again and again what had happened and how he had been led, she herself was beginning to sense how momentous this occasion was. Do we have that awareness, friends, that God is unfolding his eternal purpose week by week? I think it's R.C. Sproul that said, every moment is eternal. What does he mean by that? Every moment is eternal. Every moment you spend in church with your Bible or every, anywhere else, it is significant for eternity. Jesus said we are laying up treasures in heaven. What we're doing with every five minutes, every hour, every day of our lives is, has consequences. It's eternal. So these actions of Rebecca. We're going to bring about the whole generation of the people of God for ages to come. There was a readiness of sacrifice as well. 
We know that we read in, in verse 58 <clears throat> that when she was called and they said, will you go with this man? She said, I will go. Three simple words. But how much of a sacrifice was in these words? Can you imagine what it was? She brought up in a comfortable home. She'd heard about Abraham and how he was living out in the dusty places with a tent, no mod cons, as they say. She would have to rough it from there on in her life. These were, this, this, these were the uh, conditions that she was facing. These were the sacrifices. This is the price she had to pay. And yet, without hesitation, she said, I will go. Why? Because over that night, perhaps, I don't think she would sleep much that night, she would be thinking over what's ahead of me here. That sacrifice involved deliberation. She'd think, what will I lose if I go there? What security? What safety? What differences? What changes? To the life I'm accustomed to, it's all going to change. I'm going to have to leave it all behind. But that deliberation gave way to a determination. It's obvious that she came to this conclusion that whatever the cost might be, if this is God's will for me, there's so much evidence that God is at work in this situation. And though I've only a short time to make up my mind, I know have you ever come to that place, friends, a place of choice? You've had to say, well, whatever it costs, I know what God expects of me, and I dare not resist. And so she came to that decision, I will go. And it finishes with this. It finishes with the consummation Yes, she decided. Yes, it's all go now. The <clears throat> camels have to be harnessed and she has to prepare what she needs to take with her all of a sudden and pack up her bags because there's no time to waste and off they are. Setting off on the journey, it must have been all uh, new to her, riding on that camel, the town of her nativity left far behind and now she's on this unknown road trusting herself to this servant and his men and she has a maid or maybe two with her and what a journey that must have been it's not mentioned but you and I know that it was hours and days maybe weeks of traveling wearily through the dust, through the arid desert, through the scorching sun, through even hostile areas where they were in danger. All the time, Rebecca is kept going with the expectation of that person that she's going to meet, the person that God has appointed for her. Are we living like that, friends? I don't know what journey you're on, whether it's arid or scorching, what uh, plagues and difficulties and burdens are making the, your progress difficult. Uh, as a believer, sometimes you're weary with the way and you're saying, how long is it going to take before I see his face? But you're kept alive. You're kept moving by that vision you have of seeing your saviour. It's after long expectation. It's after a burning intention. Rebecca was a woman of character. Perhaps her character isn't always show its best in later times. She seems to be like most of uh, her family, quite devious at times. But that doesn't take away from the fact that she had the burning intention. Perhaps her maid said to her after a day or two, 
oh, this is too much. I don't think I can go bear this any longer. Why don't we just uh, say, let's go back home? Uh, because we're not going to see our friends ever again. Rebecca would say, no. Because there was a burning intention in her heart. She'd committed her heart to this way of serving the Lord. And this was after the hesitation of others. She, had to, she, was, uh, she was shut in with herself because her family were saying, wait, wait, wait a minute. We'll take 10 days to think about this. It might not be such a good idea after all. In fact, her family, despite their lineage, were not the people of faith that she was. Why did they stay in Ur of the Chaldees? Why did they stay in Nahor when they could have joined Abraham, even as Lot did and Sarah did? No, they had stayed at home. And that lingering, earthbound, worldly mentality was holding them back and was, ho and was holding Rebecca. And they said, let's wait for 10 days. And she said, no. No, there might be some things hindering you from going forward in the pathway of obedience today, friends. Are you where you should be? Or are you lingering and holding back? When the command is coming, go forward. Follow me. Don't allow any hesitation to hold you back. Because God is sovereign and we cannot do other than step by step walk with the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank thee for the wonderful example of that young lady of old and how we are constantly challenged to serve that purpose of the Lord. We know how that servant could have been excused if the woman had refused and how deadly it is when we, faced with the challenge of the gospel, delay and eventually refuse. Grant us, Lord, that readiness of heart uh, that vision of our Saviour and that rejoicing in the consummation of that fellowship with him, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon you now and ever. Amen.